Welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We just finished our live five-day profiler training event. And we had a group of students come in from all over the world, quite frankly, to learn the art of conversational profiling. And what we ended up doing is we actually ended up programming an extra bonus day because we invited Dr. Dario Nardi to come and join us for the entire event for profiler training. And so it's usually from Tuesday to Saturday. And on that Sunday, we invited Dr. Nardi to do some live brain scanning in front of a live studio audience. We had him talk a little bit about his subtype concepts because he's been working on this new resource material, a new book he's working on. So he's sharing some of his insights with our profiler training students. And man, it went all day on Sunday. We, we just we maximized our time together as long as we could. And so by the end of the day, everybody's tired. We've had a lot of conversation, a lot of back and forth, a lot of teaching, a lot of exploration together. And everybody was left. We gathered into a circle, into a, a group and we're just going to have a free-form conversation. And at the last minute, I asked Christian on our team, I said, can we record this? And Tony and I will carry microphones. We'll put a microphone on Dr. Nardi. And I'd love to record some of the conversation that emerges from this. So Christian went and hit the recording really quick. In fact, you can kind of hear some of the audio adjustments at the very beginning of this because I end up talking really loudly and he pulls the volume down because it was so in the moment, unexpected, unplanned. It just emerged at the end of the day. But we thought it was a really great conversation we'd love to share with you because we talk about all sorts of concepts and ideas and questions from students that were there. And I think you get kind of a casual, real-time, off-the-cuff conversation with myself, Antonia, Dr. Nardi, and then the students that are, are present to the moment. Yeah, we we ended up venturing into a lot of very interesting, or a lot of interesting territory, I think. We talked about the ethics of I think just the system itself and how we can maintain higher ethical standards as people who are into this concept, you know, the system of type. We ended up talking about, you know, legacy plans and honoring people who have come before. It, it was a really interesting conversation. There's a couple notes I want to make before we, we launch over into that, though. Uh, the first one is, I mean, I always talk a lot. <laughs> if you listen to the podcast, you know, talking is not a problem for me. And also, after five days of doing it, I think I was tired and I was losing my voice. Well, this is day six. This is the end of day six. Exactly. Actually. It's the end of day six. And so both you and I, I think, are kind of subdued. Like we have a real chill vibe going on <laughs> because we're so tired. And I may have lost my voice a little bit. I can't remember. So that's the first note. The second one is, I know Dario would be uh, salty about us calling them subtypes. So I want to, uh, I remember, he, not salty, he wouldn't be salty, he'd be awesome. But uh, I think that idea of subtype, he wants to actually more talk about it as a variant. And for uh, a very, Thank you, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and for a very specific reason, I think this idea of subtypes tends to lock us in. And I think uh, the whole point of the model that he's been developing, which is awesome, if you haven't seen any of them, any of his work around it, it's burgeoning work around these different variants, around how we use cognitive functions within our type and how that gives us opportunity to expand and explore the other variants so that we make sure that we're not unnecessarily limiting ourselves even within the definition of type. So that was one note that I wanted to make as well. And was there any other note? Well, just a general comment that we'd spent a whole week together. So there's some shorthand of cognitive functions that we're not going to clarify for you listening. Maybe if you're unfamiliar, we're going to, we're going to, you know, this is a continuation of discussion from people that have been together for a long time. So we've, we know each other, we kind of know each other's vibe. We might allude to things that happened earlier in the day because we, did these brain scans and then we looked at them and we compared and contrasted them together as a group on a screen in front of us. So you're, you're not seeing all the visuals that are surrounding mm. us. You're not seeing the right. dynamic. You're getting to hear the conversations happening around some of those things. Just so you know that if you're missing a piece of information, you're not stupid and you don't, you didn't follow the script. You probably are literally missing a piece of information. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just, you just weren't there. So some stuff may not make total sense. Yeah. This emerged as almost like a fireside chat sort of situation at the end of the day. Yeah. It was almost impromptu at the end of all of the other stuff. But like you said, we have like six days of rapport building and intimacy and it almost becomes like a little temporary family. So yeah, yeah there's there's some casualness in there. And like Joel said, if you miss something, it might be because of the context. Yeah. So we'll see you on the other side. But right now we're going to take you to the main room where we were doing profiler training for five days and then this special experience with Dr. Nardi. Let's go there now. Okay, right now we are uh, 
at Proof Alert Training in Orlando, Florida, and we are in a semicircle. Probably about 25 students are here. Dr. Dario Nardi's been presenting all day, brain scanning research. We actually did some real live brain scanning on the stage. Uh, then we had a presentation about holistic and analytic functions. And so now we're going to have a little bit of a free form conversation where students are able to ask Dr. Nardi any questions that come up if you want to. It's kind of an open source conversation, but I thought we could at least record it so other people could be part of this conversation. So having said that, does anyone have a question to kick us off with? And uh, If you could just say your name and type, that would just help for the recording too, so people know where you're coming from. Uh, Logan, INFJ. Um, I, I feel like in all of this, going back to the very beginning of the talk with the, the brain scanning based research, I feel like in all this research, there's kind of like a four step process of how it goes. It's, we just don't have enough data and we just need more, like in this case, brain scans. There's we have all the data, but we don't have the tools that we need to break that data down in a way that it can be like human consumable. And then there's okay, so we have all the human consumable data. We just need like scientists who know this stuff to put it together into like useful lessons. This is a very DIKW thing, by the way. Um, and then the, the fourth part of that would be the scientists have all figured it out and they're all screaming it to the masses and nobody's listening. Is in that pipeline? Is do you think there's a particular like the particular uh, like a weakness or, or you know a growth opportunity I guess would be the positive phrase for, for this like kind of research. Hmm. Very broad question. Uh, I would say personally, my thinking back, my research process doesn't my personal research process doesn't follow that pattern. Um, but I understand what you mean generally speaking. So there are very few people in personality psychology. Period. Even five factor approach or whatnot, who are looking at brain imaging. Uh, some of it has been the challenge up until recently, the cost of doing brain imaging on what is perceived to need to be like hundreds of thousands of subjects. Some of that is being solved in different ways. So there certainly is still a quite a bit of a need to do that first step, which is to gather more data. I would say where things break down is Many times in a research study or academic process, the, the, the investigators aren't actually sitting with the subjects, the people who are do, getting brain imaged. They put them in a cubicle to assess their personality, um, a physical cubicle, and they trust completely the statistical analysis technique that they've chosen in order to reveal the the secrets hidden within the data. So that seems to be the mindset. And then they tend to not find very much. Um, because I, I read like there, there was, there's a couple of studies now on five factor traits and um, brain imaging. And yeah, they find some things, but it's not really very exciting. It's, you know, it's something that could be described in half an hour and that would be it. And so then it seems like it's a dead end. And so people stop engaging in it. Or somebody comes along smartly and says, maybe you are using the wrong analytical tool, which in the United States means we just have to find a different statistical technique because there's a conflation of science and doing statistics, which many academics think are somehow the same thing. So there definitely has been a blockade. Uh, now, along the way, people have said, well, maybe if we make the data more visualizable, and this is something that has gone into different universities and research centers and ways to present data is like if we can at least make the data in a more like 3D visual form or whatever it is that we'll see or at least appreciate stuff that we didn't see before. Uh, and I think that's helped. The piece which is often missing is that there is no theory or model behind what it is that they're doing. And generally speaking, in most scientific disciplines, there's the people coming from the data analysis point of view and gathering raw data, and then there's like the people, and it could be the same people, coming from the theory point of view, and they find like where do theory and data match or not with each other, and well, maybe we need to adjust the theory, or we're looking at the data set the wrong way, or something like that. With personality psychology, as, as a general discipline, there aren't really any models. In, in an academic sense. Like five factor has no, like it's just purely about behavioral traits. There is no model of cognition or anything like that. To go to do that, you have to go to cognitive science, which they consider a different discipline and not their area. 
weirdly. So then that's another factor is that even within psychology, there's this little group that's basically decided this is personality. Uh, and then there's this other group saying neuroscience and they're like, oh, well, this is how we do neuroscience. And all these little groups don't really talk to each other. So that's another hindrance uh, in terms of getting the word out or even finding anything interesting because the people who could find something interesting are not the same people who are doing the research. With my process, I began with the hope that something would relate to personality. And I chose Jung's model because it's about cognitive processes. I mean, ultimately, they're processes at the end of the day, like perceiving and judging and intuiting and thinking and feeling and so on. So I'm like, okay, and the brain is a processing device, so there maybe is there something. And I also took the attitude that if we want to capture the human behavior and functioning and experience, the, the human experience, I need to actually sit with the people and we need to allow them to do social activities. Now, there are some people who do in like behavioral psychology or sociology, like they put groups of people together for like prisoner's dilemma and stuff like that. Like you get groups of people together and that's cool. There's even brain imaging studies of people doing prisoner's dilemma. Is like, this is like a game theory thing to see how people behave with each other when there's like uncertainty and risk. And, but that hasn't really spread to psychology. And the way I compensated for the fact that I have a more informal structure is that I keep them longer there and I'm not trying to look for micro things that hinge on whether or not we started it, you know, exactly the second or exactly that second. I'm just like in general over one hour, like what did we get? I tried to compensate. And all along the way, I always, always have thought about how is this presentable or usable? Because I come from an engineering background. So a picture of a bridge is useless until you, I mean, not completely useless, but you want to know, is the bridge functional? And it's the same thing. Like if people can't understand or use their results, obviously people have had a desire the last few years I've observed on the internet to get at subtypes. There is a perception that this like, not all ENFPs are the same. And there's this other perception that's also confident it's like we have technology, we have the technology, we can do it. Like why is it in the 21st century we're only, we're stuck with 16 types? No, I mean, and I get that. There's like this feeling that it's like, why are we stuck with 16? Can't we be more exact? When I had not one but two different clients come to me and say, can you be more exact? Because our team is already like five ESTJs. How do we differentiate them? I mean, that's, I'm like, okay, well, let's do it. So at least let's take an approach with the data. So I think really instead of it, for me, I don't think of it so much as a pipeline, although I agree in general, there's a stereotype or a thought that science follows a pipeline. But in practice, there are all these different, it's like we have to satisfy multiple variables at once. And many times it looks like a pipeline because the person doing the research is only trying to satisfy one or two variables. Whereas I've always thought like, how is this usable? How will it be presented visually? What kind of data is it? There are different statistical techniques. Like how do I pick one? And if that means that over the course of the research, I have to pick, like I have to change what I'm doing. Like I use a different statistical technique, which is actually good. I'm glad like 10 years ago, I decided to change statistical techniques and I got much better results. But that it was like a minority view. They're like, no, no, we're using this other thing. And then finally, in the last couple of years, neuroscience people are like, oh, maybe this like coherence analysis isn't the right thing. Maybe we should be using network analysis. And I'm like, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I don't really know, but it got better results. So there was respect to something, not just like, oh, I'm going to blindly publish a paper. As for like whether it supports type or not, and what will take to get type, I really think, to be honest, even though I love the work that I do, that the work of Mina Barmani will end up having a greater impact because of just as, first of all, like her academic standing in being in academic psychology, doing statistical analysis, validating Jung's model of functions, which has no validity up until now. I mean, no, like people did MBTI, but the MBTI is not the eight functions. It, there's no, there are no eight function questions in it. And nor, nor can you magically extrapolate them. You can try, but it's not, there, are no, there are no eight function questions. Now we have an instrument that has eight function questions in it that has been validated over tens of thousands of people. 
that I'm like, okay, and I think that that will have a huge impact that will create like the foundation that we can build on. Whereas I think like neuroscience is very messy because our lives are messy and the brain is evolutionary in nature and it's easier to prove a formal model than it is to prove, how do you prove the organic, it's like prove a forest, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, prove an ecology, you know. So every person is messy, I'm just trying to simplify it in a way that people can digest and, and I do get feedback that says like, oh, you know, you've, like, you're, you're trying to teach too much of the ideas as you're presenting the results. And I'm like, if I don't, then what am I doing? So yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like I want to educate a little bit along the way. So I don't know, that's where I am in that process. Sorry for such a long like, answer, but, but that was that. Sarah, ISTP, coming out of this week, I think one of the questions that I always struggle with is, how do you prioritize growth? Because like, I want to do yoga, I want to meditate, I want to work on my TI, I want to work on embodiment, I want to, I mean, but also like, I have to keep myself alive, which as a perceiver, honestly, takes a, a lot of effort. <laughs> um, so I guess, do you have any insights for like, how do you think, I, I mean, I know maybe it's just, I need to think on longer time scales. I like to do everything right now. Um, but do you have any insight into that? Because there just are so many avenues. If I am struggling or if I'm trying to prioritize my growth, I ask, is there healing work that needs to be done first? Because it's really hard to do any achievement or transcendence work if you've got traumas that, you're, yeah, that you have to overcome. And in the model of cognitive functions, a lot of times when you're dealing with something like, I was never allowed to be in my dominant or auxiliary function, I probably have some trauma there. Right? I probably need to do some healing work that will help me to get to the other side of just giving myself permission and then figure out what are all the things that have like sort of kept me down. And, and, and by the way, healing can also be physical. Um, if you are physically sick, you have to heal from that too. And that doesn't just mean like a cold or whatever. I mean, like if there's any sort of like physical ailment that's going on perpetually, if your body needs attended, if it needs to get to a baseline of health, then that's the, in my opinion, that's a first line. Like like make sure you, your gut is healthy. Make sure that you're able to get the nutrients from your foods. Make sure that you've got um, a good exercise regime and that you're sleeping well and that, that sort of thing. So even within healing is like layers there too, right? Make sure your body is good. Make sure your emotions are good. Make sure your psychology is good. And then once you're healed, then now you have an opportunity to go to achievement. And then I always put transcendence sort of last on that list. Uh, because it's really hard. Once you get into transcendence work, it's really hard to get back into achievement because you stop caring. And so um, I always say hit achievement first and and then go to transcendence. But it's almost like a three-legged stool. Uh, what will happen is once you heal and um, and get to a baseline and then move on to achievement, more pressure through the pipe will expose cracks you didn't see before and you'll have to go back into healing. Um, and, and so you just kind of do that. Even when you get into transcendence, you realize, oh, actually, I, I missed a skill. I should probably go back and get that one. So once you've done sort of like the baseline of all, you know, of all of these, then it's a matter of hopping around with more distinction about which thing needs to be attended to. So it's not like, oh, well, now your healing work is out of the way and you never have to deal with that again. It's like, uh, once you get into growth and development, I think, and you get these big chunks down, then it's always a refinement process after that. And you can use models like, you know, type dynamics or functions or whatever to sort of diagnose your personal style of doing it, right? If you've got healing work to do and it's uh, psychological healing, then you as an introverted thinking user are going to go about it differently than somebody who's using introverted feeling. So then you apply what you understand about yourself to all of these different aspects of, of growth and development. And also sometimes the type itself will tell you what needs healed, right? Because you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be able to do this better and I'm not. Why can't I do this better? Or this is the, I, I wanna explore this other flavor in achievement, this other flavor of my functions because I, I realize I've been too one-sided on it. So the tool will inform the growth and the growth informs the tool if that makes sense. And then any tool you grab, it's the same relationship. Sometimes it will point out things that you didn't know that you need to work on. And sometimes you know what you need to work on, but you don't know how, and the tool will help you figure that out. So um, as far as prioritization, in my opinion, healing's always first. 
achievement second, and then transcendence third. And then, and then it's refinement, and then you grab all these tools to help sort of guide the path. I'm not sure if that's helpful, if that's too abstract, but. Yeah, I, I actually have nothing. I was going to talk about the three-legged race piece, and I have nothing else to add to that. If you do, Dario, mm. I, I agree completely with you, Antonia. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I would just add that you might want to think of how you can rearrange your life to actually you know, your lifestyle in a way to give you the opportunities that you want. So if you're spending like 40, 50 hours a week working at a job, which yeah, pays the bills and this and that, but isn't connected to your interest really, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that short term, but the question is, is can you change your life around so that you actually do? I mean, it's sort of like the person who loves yoga and this is, oh, I'm gonna open a yoga studio. That might actually be a dangerous like too quick choice to make, but it does then at least provide a different lifestyle and different opportunities. Perhaps not as much money and more risk and that kind of thing. So at the same time, you wanna think about like how is this still financially viable? So what do you think, it, back to your research, uh, what do you think is a realistic good case scenario end-ish point for your current stream of research. Are you imagining that we're going to be able to have um, sometime in the future some level of uh, measuring some physical manifestation of personality types such that we don't have to rely on testing methodologies and all that kind of stuff to be able to distinguish people? Or where do you, where do you see this going, kind of? Uh, name and type uh, will and INTP. Mm. Uh, my honest answer is probably what will happen at some point is some mainstream piece of culture will pick up on the idea of brain imaging for psychological profiling or skills pro profiling. And that the person's phenomenal, ph phenomenological experience of themselves will as usual, at least in American psychology, be ignored. And they'll simply, you know, yeah, you'll have a brain imaging session, like somebody will do a scan of you, they'll take that scan, they'll generate a report, and that's you. And there'll be some language around that about how the brain is plastic and flexible and you can change over time. And they'll probably end up being a set of personality or skills profiles, which are based upon the brain imaging and not upon any other like theoretical model or something like that. I think in practice, this is probably going to happen. Um, just like the five factor approach was based on analysis of like word clustering that has nothing to do with any psychological model. They just like threw out hundreds of words to see how those clustered together. I think that's what's going to happen. The question is, is like, what can we do to maintain the, the phenomenological experience, the, the human inner experience to be relevant and not just like commodified or like, oh, this is a profile of you that's a static thing, but has a growth component to it. And that's sort of our job. Uh, Jung continues to be popular after 100 years. I think a lot of the, his material is timeless. It will be probably popular in 200 years. So that part of it I don't worry about. So I just feel I'm doing my part and like pushing the raft forward to keep it relevant. And I, I don't know what it will turn into. I personally, once I write the second version of my book, Neuroscience of Personality 2.0, then that's it. Like, I am, like I'm leaving that responsibility to another generation. Because like I can't let it take over my life, and that's like a karmic obligation. I don't want to take more on. You you feel a sense of obligation now because you started. Yeah. Like, like, like a responsibility to it. Yeah. No. I this, some INTJ came up to me and he's like, you know, by introducing this, so many people are like following what you're doing. They're putting a lot of faith in you. And he was saying this in sort of a reprimanding kind of way. And I'm like, dude, I already know this. Thanks. Um, so I feel an obligation to go further to a certain point. But then once I reach that point, I'm going to stop because then it will take over my life. And I don't want that. I feel it's like many people suggest, why don't you do this and this and this and this and this? And I'm like, why don't you do that? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think this speaks to some of the things we've been working on this week here at Profiler Training. You're talking about this idea of it kind of being this static model that's commoditized and marketed and sold. You know, your psyche's bought and sold with some brain scans, like your vision of this in the future. There's, there's a subjective and 
how do you say it? The the um, personalization of the experience for the mm-hmm. self, mm-hmm. right? Like the the sense of self that's not going to be able to be measured. It's a it's a you are the instrument kind of idea. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm guessing that you would suggest that maybe what we're doing here continues that tradition of two psyches talking together and coming to some conclusions and finding best fit type and growth mm-hmm. paths together through the art of conversation, quite yeah, frankly, yeah, yeah. which I think would be very powerful. That, that's different than measuring with brain scans, as an example. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. You're right. I, I don't think anything can replace the self-discovery process and in, including other people. So I never feel like, oh, an instrument should replace, like, you know, people, like MBTI cannot replace uh, a human profiler. It's a data point, but it doesn't replace like the one-on-one experience. Just like people get five-factor results and they're like, I already knew this about myself and it's boring and there's nothing to do with it. And some of it's insulting. And so I think by having a person there always thinking about who are you and what is your application and, and allowing the person to tell their story and, and helping them to the next part of that story. I mean, that's what coaching should be about. Not just like, oh, here's your results from your brain scan. And we're going to move you over into an accountant, you know, accounting department now because, I mean, and yet you, that could very easily happen, right? We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning. We are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. Uh, Will INTP again. So it seems to be that you sort of, as an as a unique individual, have put this responsibility of yourself of of having a marriage between the scientific method and, uh, but also a respect for Jungian framework and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so you're going to get your your two point out, and then that's your responsibility done. What do you find to be one of the biggest barriers to pushing it on past your self imposed expiration date? Do you think that we need more people who need a marriage of um, a love of science and this stuff? And do you think that there's not enough of that? Is it a funding issue? Is it the scientific community poo-pooing this so much that it creates a negative downward pressure for be- people being able to get into this? Like, what do, you, what do you think are the biggest barriers that we face? So it's sort of like, what, how is it that the younger generations can carry forward the, the value of type? I think if there were more, there was a period when there was a lot of, scientific studies, albeit in the traditional pencil paper tradition. Like we studied like 5,000 nurses at like these, you know, 80 hospitals. And we got this type information with them and we compared that to the doctors at the hospitals and saw they were very different types and therefore da, da, da. Uh, And there's a lot of that kind of research and that served a particular era and it was nice. I don't think people feel the need to have that right now. It's already been done. So I don't know what's next or what's needed. I mean, I tend to think most things that are academic are not really serious, even though they claim to be serious. So, you know, that's what I loved about Jung's work is that, is, is, I mean, he's saying this, he's like, I'm not a mystic. It's just he took psychology very, very, very seriously. And I think people who think like, oh, you need to follow the typical way of doing things and that's meaning that you're doing it seriously. I'm like, no, that's not what it means. So always, I think no matter what you're doing, like as a coach, like, are you taking coaching seriously? And this like continue your growth and development as a coach and like push the boundaries and like find out what is your gift that you add to it and be willing to rethink certain things. And I think as long as there's energy going in and out of the system, of type, then there's, it will continue to be alive. And as long as it meets a need, and this is weird actually, be, by the culture doing so many things that don't meet people's needs, it's actually what allows type to flourish informally. 
because I mean, where where else do you get something that e even just like the random like you know type forum is going to talk about some functions or like your shadow or whatever it is? People don't even know quite what that means, but they're still feeling like it's addressing something that's not being addressed anywhere else. And I don't think that there are very many things to replace it. And I do feel like I notice that there, for example, there's a lot of I'm going to say younger people let's say just millennials in the psychedelic community. And they've had really great experiences and they grow as individuals from sort of the therapeutic facilitated use of psychedelics. And they also are totally their type and they're still gonna have to go through all the type development issues. They may be better prepared for them now. And I think that's great, but they still have to go through that process. So in that sense, I would say it's like taking life seriously, not like, you know, no humor, because um, God forbid, lack of humor is a sign of, you know, run. <laughs> no, I mean, any movement or set of ideas that lacks humor, that's an immediate flag that that's like, uh, that's dead over there. It's, it's totalitarian, like run from it. But, uh, you know, it's just like whatever you choose to do, like just really strive to be a professional in the classic sense of that it's a vocation. And that what are you really, how can you really stretch yourself? And then by the quality of your work and the interactions that people have with you, that's, what, that's why Myers-Briggs has lost footing because they changed their strategy at the top and they eliminated all of the, the qualifying programs that were in the middle, which created so much passion in people. And now there's just this routine, very corporate three-day training that's like, there's no energy in it. There's nothing wrong with it technically. It's just like, it's lifeless. And they're nice people. And there's nothing wrong with the MBTI instrument. But um, that's what I would say, is like you keep finding your passion and take your vocation seriously. And stay focused on what it is that you can offer and that society needs and your client needs. And most people need you know, like a human to human interaction. It seems like to me, as you're talking, the idea of bypass comes up. Whereas I think every young generation, I did this when I was a young person, I wanted to bypass, I wanted to take shortcuts. I think the unique situation that young people find themselves in now is technology enables that to be ubiquitous and final in a lot of ways. In other words, the bypasses that, like we, like this, this idea that my friend Nee talks about, he calls it black box thinking where in our modern world, so much is handled systemically behind the scenes. We just push a button on a box, quote unquote, like our phone on an app and stuff happens. We have no idea how it happens. We've lost as humanity, the ability for the, the wiring behind the button. Like we don't know how that stuff happens. And it's more and more with technology, we're able to do that. And so we're, we're, I think our culture is starting to do bypasses and go around some of the analog understanding. Like you said, a young psychedelic community the, the, the idea probably for some young people is like, well, if I do psychedelics and I prepare myself in this way, well, that's going to solve all my issues and you're going to do my growth for me, right, as a technology. But it doesn't. You, like you said, you still have to go through all, you can't bypass. You can equip yourself, but you can't skip steps. And I think that's what you're speaking to a lot. Yeah, it, it's, it's very much like, okay, every medical doctor in the U.S. goes to medical school. And so they're qualified to practice medicine. And then the question is, is when they prescribe drugs to the patients, did they base it purely on what their textbook and the pharmaceutical representative tells them, or have they actually bothered to take extra courses in say drug biochemistry and learn and even just pay attention with feedback to follow up on people and be like, oh, this actually has side effects like that are too much. Like, I don't want to give this to my patients. And like, do they take that seriously or do they just sort of follow along with what everybody else is doing? We, you know, and I think that's true in any profession. And even though we mean well, it's like, do we have a chance to do that? But then there is a price to going outside the box. And to speak to your question, Will, I think what I'm hearing is that the answer is um, it, uh, if there's a person who's willing to be a steward, none of those things will matter. You know, it's like, what, what's the thing that's keeping, you know, who, who will take up the mantle and who's the next person and what are they lacking or what are the things that are against him? And I think the answer is if they're a really, if they're a proper steward, none of that stuff is against them. They'll figure it out. 
right? But it's got to be the person who's the willing steward. Yeah, I, I feel like stewardship is a really important way to think about it. That when we, we've all inherited something in a way, instead of having this attitude like, oh, I can just remake it however I want to. It's like, no, like, are you being a good steward of this? Like, it's worked for a long time. That doesn't, there's still room for improvement and it needs to be, keep evolving. But you still also need to be a good steward. Like, there are definitely people in the type community, I mean, on the internet or whatnot, it's like, oh, we can just redefine the functions and, like, we can make a whole new system except call it the old system. And is like based on sort of this and a little bit of that. And I'm like, you're a really awful steward. And you're causing harm to people by confusing them about their type. Like, have you thought about that? And so I don't know, maybe that's my introverted feeling coming out, but. <laughs> no, I agree with that. Will to pee again. Uh, so how do you think we as a community can promote stewardship rather than guruism? where people are just chasing some type of uh, self-promotion and they're using the, the information and then maybe taking a little bit of a spin or doing something just for self-promotion so they can feel important and all of that kind of stuff because that's such a strong driver for so many people. And how can we as a community who cares about the integrity of this as a useful tool for, for true self-growth and helping people, how do we fight back against that? Not to create a divide here, but it is a problem and it should be addressed. I'm sure I was going to look to you. Hmm. The <laughs> well, I would, yeah. uh, first of all, I would just say that, is that the goal? Like there is a, there is a space for not everyone's equipped to be in the lead and take the lead and help cast a vision and help galvanize groups of people. Like we have leaders for a reason, right? We have top of organizations. So I don't know if we're, we're we want a flat organization for everything because People taking the lead and stepping into leadership is important. I just think we need more of them and they need to be federated. Like that's my personal view. It's not just like get rid of that. It's all just democracy now purely because that, that won't work either. And to be clear, it wasn't so much just flat, flattening the structure, but promoting those who do have the capability of being the stewards. How do we promote a respect for the information in them before they take the step to become that steward? Like, for example, you guys distinguish yourselves as at least in my opinion as people who take this seriously and honestly as an investigation of the human experience and how do we help ourselves grow and, and not trying to present it in like a salesmanship kind of way and how can we go and create programs around this so that we can make money from this but you're on an honest journey yourself sharing that with other people and in that honesty are able to provide even more value for people so how can we share that intention with how this information is used into the next generation of stewards as they are being fashioned right now and consuming presumably your content. For, I mean, still even now, so when people get MBTI certified, part of the test is an ethics section. And I think that's great. If you ask a lot of people on the internet who've like started their own little like type companies or whatever, and you're like, what are the ethical guidelines that you have for type? Be like, uh, I don't know. I didn't think about that. Um, on the other hand, lawyers also have to take, you know, an ethics course, and that doesn't seem to help them very much as a profession. Um, so I, you know, I, I think a lot of it then comes down to incentives, and there's n it's very difficult to legislate good behavior in people. So I think there there is some of that. I think ultimately people carry on with the, the positive experiences or the negative ones that they've had. And so they use that. So the role of anyone who's using type is to create positive and effective experiences for people. I don't just mean positive in the moment. And then the people after that will carry it forward. So an example would be that somebody came to me and she is developing, there's like a dozen of them now, type and matchmaking services. When she first came to me like two years ago and said some stuff that she was doing and whatnot, I'm just like, I'm not going to help you. Like you can't, first of all, you can't just give people each like a test and then there's no process to like clarify their type in some way. There's no ownership or responsibility around that. A lot of people will be mistyped. And then besides that, this idea that she had that there were ideal matches, you know, like INFJ should be with ENTPs or ENFPs or whatever it is. 
And I'm like, but that's not what the science says. And I don't think that's really healthy for people. Like that's gonna create a lot of false expectations. And the data says a lot of other, the data mainly says that satisfying relationships are built upon self-awareness of each person. Like you, you, the, the relationships have a better chance of succeeding when each person is, has their own self-awareness. Not even communication or something like that. Like that's the foundation. It's like the self EQ stuff. And that has nothing, like I believe any type can marry and get along with any other type. Like it just, just matters their emotional intelligence and their like general level of maturity. Obviously the details will be different. So I didn't hear from her for two years and I figured, oh, okay. And then she came back to me and she's like, you know what? She's like, you were right. Like we've been trying some stuff with people and it doesn't work and this and that. And she's like, okay, now I'm here and I'm willing to listen. Like, what, what do I need to know? In that way, she, she learned from like negative feedback and she was willing to adjust, which I think is really great. I don't know, there's some elements in the type community which I think are unhealthy. I don't feel like I'm the one to lead a crusade or something against that. Uh, and sometimes doing that simply creates more conflict and polarization. And sometimes it's just best to let things melt away because they naturally will have a negative experience. So I would focus on creating positive experiences that improve people's lives. Yeah, I just hear you say model it. Yeah, Basically model the it. best yes. thing you can do is just model it. And, um, and I, I also feel like there are various communities because there's a lot of different kinds of people into type and some of these communities are attracting the, the people they should attract, right? And so that's where everybody's at. That's where the, the people who are at the top are at and that's where the people who are following them are at and it doesn't really have to be with judgment. You know, it's like, that's just where they're at and there's probably some facility for them in that moment of their timeline. And as long as the kinds of communities you're talking about, like the, the, the ones that you would like to see, as long as those exist, then there's a place for people like you too, you know what I mean? And, and like me. So um, modeling what we'd like to see and modeling good stewardship and having experiences that, you know, evidence the, the power of what we think are good, mod you know, good models and showing it to be both powerful and effective and ethical and all those things. Um, as long as those communities exist, then there's a place, there's like a place for everybody. Do you know what I mean? Susan, INFJ. Um, I, I liked your comment, first of all, and it was on the line that with where I was going. So um, when, maybe pipeline wasn't the right word, but um, an ecosystem that has to do handle people at all stages of health. And how do you retrain and uh, shepherd and guide people who have this interest, even if from the perspectives of those of us in the room, they might be a little bit off kilter. I mean, letting them die out is one thing, but like you said, they have audiences and who have needs. And if you want to really see this work, and I, I'm seeing this in my head, I'm sorry, I, just, I can't, I'm apologizing for an eye thing. I just, uh, but I, this is, the, the global constructs requires infrastructure of all kinds of technologies and something that, where people understand so it won't be misused. And, and then you need to train people and, and, the, and the people who have an interest in this, they need to, the opportunity to be, um, for their trajectories to be changed, to move out in a different direction. And I also think, I, I, there's a lot of putting down Myers-Briggs, but I don't think, I'm not sure we'd be sitting here talking about it if it wasn't for Myers and Briggs. Would it have been, oh, yeah. would Union have been enough to have brought it into the public consciousness as much as it's yeah. come? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely in agreement on that. Like, uh, I, I think for the, the 50 to 100 years that Myers Briggs work has been particularly relevant, like, did an amazing service for people, it really brought something into awareness, and she really went through a long process not just her, but the people around her, to make sure that it was validated and reliable. And despite what they say on the internet, it actually is more researched and supported than any other personality instrument. Is it a little old fashioned? Yes. And, and that's, um, is it misused in certain ways in the test and tell fashion? Oh, you got your result back. This is what type you are. And they give you one option to look at, like organizations do that. Or they're like, oh, we're only hiring ESTPs for sales right now. 
I mean, there's our, our top performer was an ESFJ, so we're going to look for more ESFJs. And, and you know, there, there is that kind of thinking. And unfortunately, those are the people who often have passed through the MBTI certification program, not the people from the internet. So it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough question. I, I really believe that a lot of it comes to like how I learned all of my stuff was through mentorship. I mean, I was mentored by Linda Behrens uh, and some others, but mostly Linda. And um, I think all of us here, like in a sense, you're doing mentorship. We're doing mentorship. And all of you may eventually have opportunities to do mentorship too, to mentor others. That's really great because one person then can go on to influence, you know, eventually dozens or hundreds, thousands of people in a positive way. I also think uh, there should be a distinction between um, the system that was developed, like the instrument and the system that was developed as Myers-Briggs, and the people who are currently running the company and the choices that they've made. Yeah. And so I think that there's a distinction there too. Susan, INFJ, I, I'm just going to ask this question. My TI child may be acting up, so forgive me. But um, I guess in my head I can't help but wonder... An objective instrument could have at least give you a consistent data set that isn't influenced by human bias as profilers grow. And human bias may become a factor, and I don't think we have statistics on that yet. And so I keep bouncing over that in my head. Like, sure, if you've got an expert profiler, this is no issue. And with sort of the characteristics of a personality hacker, which is why I chose to be here, but... Um, eventually, as this grows and gets bigger, you're going to have a greater percentage of um, profilers who may have bias in their factoring that, that where an instrument might be better. So that, that's a very good question. Uh, I, my, my answer is the multiple models approach or multiple data points approach. So if you're lost in the woods and you want to know the way home, well, you, you have, and you have a map, but you don't know where you are on the map, then how do you get home? So there's multiple ways to find out. You can have a compass. You look for like really obvious landmarks. Uh, you notice where the sun is going. So you gather data points and you figure it out. So I think to, to just think, oh, we can only rely upon one data point, no matter what that is, is going to have an error rate without any possibility of correction. And then I think the other thing is, yeah, there's nothing wrong with pencil, paper, instruments. I mean, it's supposed to be about your conscious self-experience, so I would hope there's some opportunity for that to take an assessment. There can be brain imaging or something similar to say, like, this just shows where your developed self is. And notice that I've made this distinction. There's like your core self, developed self, contextual self. We need to make those distinctions. There's a developed self. And... If we're talking about something that really is about psyche, psychological, not behavioral traits, it is only the person who's having that, and this is one of the ethics criteria, even in MBTI training, that only the person who's being typed, they are the final authority on what type they are. Even if you as the profiler disagree, that's not up to you. You can give them some guidance, but your role is not to tell them what their type or assign them their type or something like that. And, and if you give a person enough data points and lead them through a process, the positive rate in terms of getting best fit is sustainable over time. The person really feels this fits well for me and like a year later it's, or six months, whenever they've done a retest, like it's not just the retest of the instrument, it's like does the person, how do they identify? And I think we can take these approaches and we can have a panel and we can have an instrument, we can have brain imaging and we can have self-reflection and this is why I believe out of 16 types, an instrument should give three results out of 16, not one. Because then that lays the final responsibility on the doorstep of the person in a really concrete way that it's like, here are three types for you to look at. 95% chance one of the three is a match. It's up to you. And then that really says like, because we live in so much consumer culture, like, Oh, to know everything about yourself internally, that should just be like 15 minute quick thing on the internet with 100% accuracy. Like who thought that that should be the case? It should be the reverse. It should take you like years to figure out who you are. So we're trying to find happy medium in between. Just as a representative of this experience, this isn't supposed to be the end all be all. 
as Daria mentioned, it's like uh, it's like one waypoint or one node in the system of helping find your type. As and and training profilers, we want to make sure that profilers understand that that's their role. They're part. They're a Sherpa, right? They're not the the end all be all. And also, uh, who knows what's coming next? Because there's a lot of disruptive technologies coming down the line in general. Right, and we don't know how those are going to impact this entire process. Like if Denise Cook has her way, Dr. Denise Cook, who we just interviewed on the um, podcast and released it like last week, uh, if she has her way, there might be a way to source it genetically, right? And at that point, you don't need profilers or a test. <laughs> you just take a, you know, you just find out what it is genetically. If she's accurate, like if her research ends up being accurate, or possibly machine learning will be will be the thing that ultimately determines what type is. This is part of an experience, and I actually think if you want to uh, figure out what your best fit type is and you've been struggling for a long time, come take profile training, right? <laughs> Just going through the process itself will help you find your best fit type. So, um, yeah, I don't think there's any, like, idea that this is the end all be all, but it's really powerful, and and I think what makes this something that I would advocate that people do as part of their process is that they get the psyche to psyche experience. That's like, uh, uh, we were talking to Do John, Dr. John Beebe, and John was saying, as a Jungian psychoanalyst, he was like, you know, Jung said this a lot of times, and I was just, I, when he said it, I was like, yes, that's right. But uh, he said, Jung didn't say this word for word, but he basically said throughout all of his writings, you are the instrument. And, um, and he's like, there's just something that a psyche to psyche experience allows to draw out of another person that literally no other methodology will do. So... This isn't the ultimate, but I think it should be an experience, everybody who's trying to find their type. I think it should be an experience they have. This is an INFJ. I'll just be quiet after this. I really appreciate your comments. It, it just the, the one caveat is that maybe there needs to be some statistical data count uh, after the psyche to psyche experience. Um, because like if everybody's from the UK or everybody's from Africa or everybody's male or, or you know, and just see what happens. Just because how do you know uh, if we don't? Like, I would trust my FE, but that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, and also never discount the human ability, and the, the introverted thinking primers in this room know this the best, for us to add in corruption unnecessarily to information. So even if we had the, the instruments you're talking about, Susan, maybe that could measure things, quote unquote, objectively or more, I think he, the, the human experience is that we like to mess that up a lot. <laughs> like we like to try to skew those results for our own power dynamics or our own uses. Like we, even if we had an instrument that was that reliable, don't doubt humans would, would try to mess it up somehow and like use it for all the things that you're hoping to solve. It's part of the human, like this is how we're wired. That's just what we do. And so I think that's, you know, I, I just, I don't know if that's ever going to be something. There's, there's never going to be that ideal purity of information that solves it all. Because humans just, I don't think we actually want that, all of us. Some people just don't want that purity. They actually want the corruption in there of the data. Because that's how they've decided to move through the world. Whether that's the right or wrong way, like moral or ethically, I just think that's how it is. Like that just is what it is. Um, Nicole, and I haven't settled on my best fit type. Um, my question is related to your brain scan imaging time that you spent. Um, and if... Um, you had ever done any scans of people who had um, trauma and if you had taken done anything with um, psilocybin and watching how their brain changed? Uh, for the most part, uh, except for a, like a handful of situations, I, I've always looked at individuals who did not have any kind of clinical condition. Now, I've had some individuals who maybe years ago had uh, you know, diagnosed with depression in the past or had like a head injury or whatever it is. And that was, you know, part of the demographic information. I've had a chance to do brain imaging with the psychiatrist at UCLA for some of his clients, patients for like major depression, like severe brain trauma, Parkinson's disease, someone with uh, several people actually with Asperger's which, you know, I mean, it's been redefined now, but we all know what it means. And, and some things like that, like anxiety and so on. Uh, it really is interesting to see how the brain imaging results are different and sometimes in very subtle ways. 
The only, I have looked, and, and in fact, it's on YouTube. I gave a presentation at UCLA on uh, 5-MeO-DMT using brain imaging and its effect on the brain to verify like what's going on with the person. Uh, some of that was just motivated by my own curiosity and I had the opportunity for someone to provide a few subjects. Then uh, it was actually funny once um, uh, cannabis became legal, like fully legal in California, I had interns and the interns were like, oh, can we do something like a study with cannabis? I, I mean, uh, people have already published studies with cannabis and brain imaging, so I have an awareness of what's, what I would probably get. What made me really curious is there are some people who have the opposite effect. Instead of the cannabis causing their brain activity to be diffused and the executive region to become less coordinated, to become weak, that in fact they somehow seem to gain executive function and become more focused. So I asked somebody to come in who reported that was his experience. And it was so remarkable even just for him to smoke a tiny bit we did like a before, during, and after, like with the brain imaging. And there isn't much of an after because the effects of the cannabis last so long. But the before and then as it's starting in and then as it changes, I mean, there was definitely a very clear change in brain activity and wiring. And actually the brain networks became different. So this is why I have a really big thing about like, okay, no alcohol for 24 hours beforehand. But really like ideally no cannabis for like a week or more beforehand because that will change a person's brain wiring and not necessarily for the better. In his case, it actually weirdly strengthened his executive function, but then he also develops paranoia and like really paranoid fantasies that he's aware of as a problem, so normally he avoids that. So that was like an interesting sort of contradictory kind of thing. Like does a better executive function actually lock in like a paranoid thoughts that otherwise would be dismissed fairly easily. I don't know. I can leave that for other people to do. That's sort of the most I've gotten with it. I was happy I looked at 5-MeO-DMT though, because that was, I wanted, and they wanted to know, I mean, the, the people wanted to know, like, does it just last 10 or 15 minutes? Or is that the after period afterwards, can a person go back into the experience? And it turns out, yes, absolutely. They can fully go back into the experience and it's worthwhile to ask people to do that. Yeah, so it really is like, I mean, we only looked at three people, but all three people had the same. And for the drumming journey, by the way, I also have done brain imaging on six people with that. And that was very, because it's not like a dream in the sense that there tends to be more coherent narrative usually, even though it's weird. But the most important distinguisher, the red flag for me was that people remember the experiences quite clearly and the drumming journey, whereas dreams are gone within like a minute of waking up. And what happens is, is that the drumming journey takes the person down into delta and theta waves, the same as if you were gonna go into a dream state. And then at some point within some minutes, five minutes later, whatever, is the person pops back up into beta waves, which is normally indicative of being very active and problem solving, except that they're lying still on the floor as if they're asleep. But because they're showing beta waves, except for the one gal who wasn't able to get into the experience at all, and then she just stayed in the delta wave experience. But the other ones went up, and they went back into this mode as if they were awake. So it's as if they're having the experience, except it's in this weird alternate spirit world. And so that, I felt, was really interesting. And that's, again, like I, there wasn't, none of those were formal studies. They're not publishable. They were just enough to do like, oh, informal presentation. Rosa INFP. I had a question about brain waves. actually. Can I assume that they go beyond your skull? Yes, it is. So the heart generates uh, an electromagnetic field as a reference point that can go out to about five feet uh, outside of you. So that if somebody has, I mean, I've never tried it myself, but this is what I've read, that if you have like an EM meter and it's held like right here, like I would detect my own heart EM field. The same with the brain, except it doesn't extend out nearly as far. So it's, it's, you know, like it's enough so that the brain imaging cap can pick it up. But even then, the signal has to be amplified 50,000 times. Now, there's a little, little detail with it. One, one is sort of interesting is that, for example, in hospitals, 
uh, you cannot have um, like a wireless signal that's within, I forget, like three feet of a, per like a patient, something like that. And the reason is, is that one reason it's hard to detect the field normally is because we have skulls that like block a lot of the activity. But some people have thicker skulls than others. And what they discovered with uh, the, a lot of the EM frequencies that are used, like with cell phones and so on, is they actually do pass through the brains of children and women. And that has an effect. So it also works the other way, that we can be affected by the fields around us. It just, I guess, on average, men have a skull that's ever so slightly thicker that blocks what's the typical. I, I know that's like what I'm saying is like really not, not, not information that we would like to think is true. That sounds like, you know, really conspiratorial almost. But it's just like a thing. Like every hospital knows this. Like you just don't put equipment too close to people because it actually mess up their brain activity for like sleep studies and stuff like that. Like this is. So the same is also true. So when you, for the heart, so when you get near somebody, if you're within like five feet of them, even just like a dialogue, never mention like an intimate experience, like your fields overlap with each other. And that's like really cool to think about in a way. It also might explain why sometimes we're just very uncomfortable with certain people. And then and that's about the limit of my knowledge on it, but yes. Because I've, I've never, I've just read, I just did an investigation and there's something called heart math where they've done more research on it. But I personally, that's like my limit. Of knowledge, yeah. Nicole, we, we did an exercise. I can't remember which, I'm so sleep deprived and my brain isn't working properly. But just to your, what you just said about energy, I think it was the NI, was it the NI exercise where we all, everybody in our area, when we, we all had to go out and like create a world and there was an overlapping theme to all of the worlds that we created. Did you notice that? Um, it all, it was like water and being able to breathe underwater and dragons and castles and the ocean. And it, and I was just like, Whoa, it's, and we were all in this one little clustered area. And so I was thinking, I'm like, God, oh, wow. Like, did we like somehow, cause we were going out to collect, you know, information in our minds. Did we somehow mingle that up and then share it? Mm. Yeah, you, you know, there, there's the sort of, you know, this is not really a solid surface because it's made up of atoms and atoms with like 99% empty space. I mean, they're not really empty space, it's fuzzy space, but sort of the same idea. And then the atoms, you know, we're talking about like subatomic particles and so on. And what are those made of? The energy. Most of it is energy. When you keep digging deeper to the chromo quantum chromodynamic level, it's just 99.99% energy. So the universe is energy, and a bit of it is organized, and some of it is self-aware. And then I think the most we can say beyond that is like, well, we, we don't know what consciousness is, but we know it exists because we experience it. It doesn't matter what it is. It, we, it, it exists and we experience it. It could be just generated by our brain, but it doesn't matter. So really, all of us here are blobs of consciousness in a sea of energy. And that's like the beginning and ending of the story. And then everything else in between is stories. I think this is kind of cool. We got to hang out and kind of do something a little different than just profiling together. So I think this is really neat. And we want to find more opportunities for these kinds of things in the community and uh, both digitally and in person. But we're really driving toward more in-person things as we move forward because we think these encounters with the self and others can be powerful like some of the concepts we've been talking about today. So thank you, uh, Dario, for being here. Thanks, everybody else, for your attention and uh, for coming for an extra day. So one of the things I hope you got a feel for by listening to all of that is the type of conversations, the type of people, the type of subject matter that comes up during profiler training. And now that's not exactly what we're working on during the days of profiler training. We're actually doing training, but the conversations in the hallways at dinner after hours end up being a lot like this, like free form conversations. This is more formalized, but if you talk to profiler training students, you would hear from them that in the corners of the hotel we had the event at, in the hallways, at dinner, like they're having these kinds of conversations the whole week. So it was really exciting to see people be able to talk like this on a regular basis with people that get it. They understand how 
their minds are thinking they can have these free conversations together, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. And even if profile training isn't in the, the stars for you, we wanted to give you at least a taste of the experience because it's so rewarding and rich. And there's so many great conversations that end up coming out of it that we wanted to make sure that you weren't completely missing out. So what did you think? You heard us tackle different topics in this conversation with students. Maybe some things came up for you. We'd love to hear from you. You know, you've heard us, Dr. Nardi, and our students on the microphone, but you haven't had a chance to voice what what you're thinking and feeling right now. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Go ahead and leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your personal story of what's coming up for you in this conversation. We want your voice to be heard too. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating review for us on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. Makes us feel good too, to be able to read it. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. If you leave us a rating and review on uh, on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And of course, you can special order it through your local bookstore and support local bookstores because it would be cool if those didn't all die out. So maybe go do that. That's cool too. And if you are looking for a program that focuses on personal growth through the lens of personality type, Look no further than the catalog, the product catalog of Personality Hacker. Head over to personalityhacker.com and check to see if there is a program that is right for you. And I just have to highlight it because it was part of this conversation and this episode, profiler training, if it's a time for enrollment at the time of this recording, or the next time enrollment comes available for applications, consider it. I think it might be an interesting further continuation of your growth and your understanding and your development and understanding typology and help, and helping people have experiences and encounters with themselves, guiding them to a best fit type for themselves, understanding how they're wired and what opportunities for growth lay ahead of them. I think that's an amazing gift to train yourself in and then give to other people. So check out Profiler Training. I think it'd be an awesome, awesome experience for you if, it, if it's the right fit. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning. We are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.